Thank you, Sophia, for your wonderful introduction. Uh, Dean Skip Rutherford, Director DePipa, my friends uh, Larry Wallace, there, and Mike Roberts, faculty and students, people of Little Rock, guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, it's quite a privilege to be here at the Clinton School of Public Service and being at Little Rock, Arkansas, which I would call the real south. This is as far south as I have come <laughs> in the 20 years that I have been in the United States. And perhaps the only graduate school that I know of that offers a graduate degree in public service. Of course, I feel honored, overwhelmed, and really appreciate the initiatives of President Bill Clinton in setting up the school and the presidential library next door, which I have yet to visit maybe after this talk. And my thanks to the school for providing me this opportunity to be able to talk to you. Since I've relocated to Pakistan, actually the last time I spoke in the United States was at the Brookings Institution, roughly about three years back, as a senator, when actually I led a delegation of senators and parliamentarians from Pakistan, uh, trying to talk to the United Nations on holding an impartial inquiry on the assassination of my friend and mentor, mentor Benazir Bhutto, who I believe was a courageous leader and a friend of the United States. Well, there were many possible topics that I thought perhaps I could come and speak on. But then, as you know, as I was debating last month, what, should, what is becoming more important now, really I thought one that is really coming up is the, the economic divide that is narrowing between the West and the East, and which is what I call that the center of economic gravity is slowly shifting away from the West to the East, and speaking, of course, as a friend of America, what are the measures that the United States and America perhaps should be looking into to perhaps slow down this shift or, or eventually perhaps even uh, stop it? And I was quite surprised that President uh, Obama, in his State of uh, the Union address uh, last week, spoke on the same subject on how to win the future. And he spoke about innovation, he spoke about research, he spoke about creativity, he spoke about education and higher education. And I think this is really the gap that needs to be filled up in most of these developing countries, which the emerging countries in the East are filling up fast. Actually, this is no different from a very routine story that we have all read about and heard during our childhood, which is the story of the hare and the turtle. It's about slow and steady wins the race. We in the United States normally think of ourselves as the hare, and we can outrun almost everyone, and we think maybe it's time that where would the turtle go? Let's just take a break, sit under the tree, and rest. And then we just go down to sleep with the result that the slow and steady turtle eventually overtakes us and is far ahead of us. And basically this is what is happening between the East and the West. Last week, you know, we have a World Economic Forum that takes place in Switzerland at the Davos. And I was looking at the headline of uh, the newspaper which comes from Pakistan, the news. And even the headline last week said something very similar. You know, everything is kind of converging together. It says economic power shifting from west to the east. And officials say Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Thailand will be emerging economies in the future. So this came out of the World Economic Forum at the Davos. And similarly, in a very recent issue of the Newsweek, January 17, 2011, in an article titled, What Asia Can Teach the Indebted West, Kishore Mahbubani, he is the Dean of Economics at the Singapore School of Public Policy, and he writes, and I quote, and this is a learning lesson for all of us, is a surprisingly little known feature 
of the Asian's economic miracle is how much it has relied upon Western wisdom. Asian societies are flourishing today because they have finally absorbed and implemented traditional Western strengths such as political pragmatism and sound economic policies. So they are learning from the West and leading now. But paradoxically, just as Asia has embraced these pillars of Western wisdom, America and Europe are abandoning them in favor of increasingly polarized politics and reckless magical thinking about their financial soundness and future resources. For most of the 20th century, Asia asked itself what it could learn from modern, innovating West. Now the question must be reversed. What can the West learn from a flourishing Asia? I think that really is the question. You know, Christopher Columbus in 1492 discovered this country, the new world, by assuming that the world is round. So he flew, he, he sailed, and he says, well, eventually I will get down to India, landed here, and he called the local natives as Indians. Today, we don't believe the world is round. We actually believe the world has become flat. And even President Obama said the world has changed instead of calling it flat. So eventually, it's, it's a leveling force that has taken place. And Tom Friedman's, if you have, most of you must have read his book, The World is Flat, he talks of the 10 flatteners. Since then, since those 10 flatteners, global business has been revolutionized. And that is where it has started making a difference. It really has been over the last eight to 10 years where the difference has come about. It wasn't before that. And of course, according to Tom, among the 10 forces that have flattened the world include, and I'm sure most of you know that, the internet explosion, which is right on top. You know, it came about roughly in the 1995s. Smart devices, including the cellular phones, you know, the iPads and iPods and everything else that you can, all the hardware gimmick that we can think of, that's two. The end of the Cold War, that made quite a difference. And things like outsourcing, offshoring, open sourcing, insourcing, and above all, reaching out to the borderless world through social networking. And as you know, even things like, you know, Facebook has now actually created the whole world into one single global village. So there are no borders, there are no boundaries. Technology has taken over, and a person sitting here in Arkansas is almost as good as somebody else sitting in some small remote village in India. There is no difference. So as a result, we are looking at a different world now. The global economic playing field has been leveled, equalized, and therefore companies all over the world Initially, you had the domination of the Western world, of the Western empires, but now everybody out in the East, out in the South, is scrambling to get their piece of cake. So it's the survival of the fittest currently. Now, innovation and entrepreneurship were actually America's strength in its rise to becoming an economic power. We need to understand that, you know, in the 20th century. However, now it's a wake-up call. Innovation and entrepreneurship is shifting to the east, it's shifting to the south. And it is this innovation and entrepreneurship which is becoming the driving force in driving these new countries into driving these new economies, or I would call the emerging economies. The World Bank says the emerging economies no more content to be sources of cheap hands and low-cost brains will outgrow the developed nations by 2015. This is out of the World Bank. So they are not content with cheap hands anymore and low-cost brains. They want to do absolutely everything the developed West and the developed North has been doing historically for the last 30, 40 years. We, of course, have had success stories out of the United States in the past uh, which lay the foundation stone, for example, of Silicon Valley, if we talk in particular about IT. Companies like Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Google, which revolutionized the internet, they were born in barns, garages, and basements. 
Now today, similar companies are being given birth in barns, in garages, and in small villages in the developing world. We had already seen a shift even before the internet of this change. If you remember the big auto, th the big three auto industries in Detroit, this was around the time I was uh, a graduate student in the United States where the Japanese car had started taking over from Detroit and the American auto industry was starting to suffer. Chrysler was almost going bankrupt at that time. So while Detroit was sleeping, Japan was transforming itself from a low-wage economy into a hotbed of business innovation. So the process had started in the 80s, and the businesses, cheap labor, the automated processes, uh, robotics, everything had started shifting things to the east. And the same thing had started off with autos, where you started making Hondas and Toyotas and Nissans in the east instead of people buying American cars. Now, of course, you can buy cell phones, which are made in China and Taiwan. These might be American or they might be Scandinavian cell phones, but they are still made in Taiwan and Taiwan. And you might be making your airline reservation and calling for your emergency, and the phones are probably answered in India and Pakistan. IBM, which was a traditional American company, it now employs more people in the developing world than in the developed world. So even these companies are kind of shifting over. And new innovative ideas are coming from the East. India is making up the Tata, the nano car, which costs about $3,000, and $300 laptops, so that these things are easily accessible to the population at large. Now, this may be not be as hot as, for example, the iPads and the iPhones to do a lot of exotic things, but it's making a difference in terms of changing the lives of billions of people when they can drive around, when they can use cell phones, when they can talk to anybody around the world, they can access the internet. And just as an example, in November, there was an entrepreneur's conference in Dubai. About 2,500 hungry innovators from 50 countries showed up, networking with each other, looking for ideas and trading for ideas. So everybody is now coming together. There are no nationalities. These are just innovative ideas that people would want to share and to be able to take advantage of. And I had read this some time ago, and I would read it, that globalization now can be best described by, this is something I read years back, but I thought I'd share it again with you. I'm sure some of you must have read it. An English princess with an Egyptian boyfriend crashes into a French tunnel, driving a Belgian, who was high on Scottish whiskey, followed closely by Italian paparazzi, on Japanese motorcycles, treated by an American doctor using Brazilian medicine. <laughs> and if you look at innovation stories, let me tell you one from Pakistan. Uh, you know, a flogger. I'm sure you know what a flogger is. In Pakistan, of course, people know of a flogger as the one that is used by the Taliban in beating up women. Now in Pakistan, a school dropout, actually he was at the university where I was the president, he didn't finish his MBA and he dropped out. And out in a very conservative area of Karachi, he opened up a company that makes floggers for the West. Okay, This is a $3 billion fetish and bondage industry. And currently the man is selling online, taking advantage of the internet, working in a very remote conservative area of Karachi, sales exceeding $1 million a year. And his survey tells me that the majority of the buyers are in the US, middle to upper class, and Democrats. <laughs> well, the United Nations World Investment Report calculates that there are 21,500 multinational companies based in the emerging world. And out of the top Fortune 500 companies, 60% of them are outsourcing to India, 27% to China, 25% to Latin America. And other emerging countries like Turkey, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Malaysia are fast creating the knowledge capital. 
and these multinationals expect 70% of the world growth to come from emerging countries. So where does America stand today when we look at this shifting of things going from here to there? And I quote Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Terminator. <laughs> and he says, I quote, it can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it does not know pity or remorse or fear, and it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. <laughs> Unquote. So, so forget about being flat, the world is turning upside down. Okay. So anyway, let's do some soul searching. Now, obviously I told you all the facts and figures. Let's figure out how this process started and why it started, and what those countries, including my country where I'm currently living, like Pakistan, are doing all the right things, and what America is doing the wrong things. So the center of gravity keeps shifting away. Well, two important forces that are driving the emerging world now, or I would say any world, one is the, ex the explosion of the information and communication technologies including the development of the next generation cellular and smart devices, its accessibility, and its affordability to the population at large. And this is exactly, I think, even President Obama mentioned in his speech, the information technology explosion taking place around the world. And the second is the increased investment in higher education, research, creativity, and innovation with opportunities for entrepreneurship. I think these are the two driving forces which are beginning to make a difference. Let us look at some facts and figures and you will begin to understand what actually is happening. Let's look at the information, internet and uh, communication technologies. We have currently two billion internet users around the world, but it has been an exponential growth. And exponential, as you know, is not linear. If you walk 30 steps linearly, you have walked 30 steps. If you walk 30 steps exponentially, you have walked a billion steps. That's the difference. So in 1984, there were just 1,000 internet users. In 1992, 1 million. In 2008, 1 billion. So you just keep on adding three zeros. And then within two years, in 2010, 2 billion. So the numbers literally doubled in two years. And guess where are the largest number of internet users now? In Asia, 825 million. North America has 266 million. So all the channels, all the cables, all the fiber optics are ending in Asia or originating from Asia, if you wish. And look at China. China, which just had 22 million internet users, is now number one in the world, has 450 million users now, from 22 to 450 million. So China is 450 million and United States is 240 million. So that's one number that I just thought is there. The cellular phone technology, mobile, wireless, the numbers are even more frightening than the internet. Because you just jump on ahead of the internet and now you can have access to the internet from your cellular phones and from your smart devices. You don't even have to stay connected to your hut or to your office. In the cellular world, the largest numbers of users are in China, 842 million users. Second highest, India, 687 million. And the US is third at 285 million, one fourth of that of China. And how does this explosion take on? Every time there is a new technology, there is a new device, it's now even picking up faster because the world is becoming smaller. It's becoming, like I said, a global village. To reach an audience of 50 million people, the radio took 38 years, the television took 13 years, the internet four years, the iPod took three years, and the Facebook took two years. So now anything that comes out probably reaches halfway across the, the world 
in less than a year. So that is how the half-life is reducing with time. Yet another example of these smart devices that I mentioned, how fast people have been capitalizing on these fast devices as they come, easily accessible, affordable, and traveling around the world. Three million units sold. The iPod sold three million units in two and a half years. The Kindle took two years. The iPad took 80 days. And the iPhone took three weeks to sell three million units. So everybody's buying it. Everybody's walking around in the pocket. And similarly, we all read about the Facebook. You know, it keeps coming now every now and then in almost every magazine. The Facebook has 550 million users. It's the third most populous country in the world, after, of course, China and the United States. And it's expanding at a rate of about 1 million a day. And we estimate that by the end of 2011, there will be more users of Facebook in Asia than in North America and Europe combined. So what does it do? Of course, it, it creates one single neighborhood. And now businesses are being conducted on the Facebook. Contracts are being signed on the Facebook, which was never happening before. Courses are being offered on the Facebook. The University of Wales is offering the first MBA degree on the Facebook. It's already doing that. I thought maybe I would offer my leadership course on the Facebook as well. I'm just waiting for to my number of friends to reach 2,000. Currently, they are about 1,800. <laughs> so I have more friends on the Facebook than in, than in real life. <laughs> and YouTube gets about a billion hits a day. And business is being conducted on YouTube as well. You know, you can sell your products on the YouTube. If you are a fashion designer, you can put up all your fashions. You can have catwalks on the Facebook, and people can see and order your products. You don't have to go to Manhattan and New York City and spend a quarter million dollars, hire a firm, and do a show so you can sell dresses. You just do it on Facebook at no cost. And that is what is happening. And one innovative idea out of the Facebook, I don't know if you have heard of the Khan Academy, have you? How many of you have heard of the Khan Academy on the Facebook? No one. Well, a Pakistani-American, Salman Khan, he did his MBA from Harvard University a few years back. And his niece, somewhere out in California, wanted some tutorials on some big, basic high school stuff. So he created a short 8-10 minute video and passed it on to her, got a creative idea, started putting everything on Facebook, and currently, he has got 1,800 videos on Khan's Academy. You can go to Facebook and watch it. And he is considered today as Bill Gates' favorite teacher. He is praised as unbelievable. And his 11-year-old son uses these videos for a school tutoring. So everything in K-12, literally, because I said 1,800 videos, any subject you can think of is explained in 8 to 12 minutes on YouTube on one of his videos. He has 200,000 users and gets about 100,000 hits a day. Yet another idea of innovation. I call it innovation in a closet, because he started off his first video in a closet using a camcorder. So this only serves as an example that even individuals, forget about the corporate world, even individuals are in a better position through innovation to touch the lives of millions of individuals instead of corporations. And this is actually the phenomena is called globalization 3.0. Globalization 1.0 was about countries. Globalization 2.0 was about corporations. And globalization 3.0 is about individuals. So in, instead of corporations and multinationals, now individuals are starting to take charge through the internet technologies. So that's about your ICTs. 
Now, the second driving force in the emerging countries is the phenomenal growth of higher education, research, creativity, and innovation with opportunities for entrepreneurship. I'll start off with, obviously, a few examples, then revert to Pakistan. Let's start about China, if you do not know these figures. What is China doing to higher education? Have you ever thought about it? Chinese higher education sector has grown to become the world's largest in just the last 10 years. The number of students at Chinese universities have grown from 1 million to 5.5 million in the last 10 years, a phenomenal growth of five times. And the Yale University, Richard Levin, Yale University president, correctly pointed out, and I quote, Richard here, this expansion in capacity is without precedence. China has built the largest higher education sector in the world in merely a decade's time. In fact, the increase in post-secondary enrollment in China exceeds the total post-secondary enrollment in the United States. So just that increase which they have got in the last 10 years exceeds all of post-secondary enrollment in the United States. It established nine Ivy League type of universities. So the old-fashioned universities of China is an old story. They are almost making universities which are as good as Ivy League universities, investing a lot of money. And look what they are doing. The number of scientific articles published out of China have taken it from 14th place to second place. Now they are currently number two in terms of number of publications, number of scientific publications after the United States. So they are even exceeding a lot of European countries as well. And along with this mushrooming growth of universities, China is also simultaneously focusing on innovation and entrepreneurship, establishing business incubators, technology parks, at each of these universities, and currently out of close to 500 uh, incubators around the world, well, the United States, of course, has the highest. They've got about 1,400 incubators because we started off way back in 1959, but in just the last five years, China has built 500 incubators with the universities. Big building up economic zones, the Shenzhen Economic Zone, which is right across Hong Kong, which was established in 1980, is today considered the fastest growing city in the world. Its economic growth, last reported, was 27%, just for this city. And out of 10 cities, actually, that survived the global recession, this was at number two. So once again, out of uh, the US Secretary of Education, which is Arn Duncan, and I quote, he says, China's growing competitiveness is a wake-up call for the United States. It has become already the second largest economy in the world after US, estimated at $9.7 trillion, $2.65 trillion of reserves. Its GDP, which was only 75 billion in 1995, has already crossed Japan and is number two. And one of the main reasons, of course, is its investment in the information and communication technologies, in higher education, in innovation, and entrepreneurship. And the bad news is, by the year 2020, China will cross United States to become the largest economy in the world. It already is number two. It has already overtaken Japan from number three to number two. It's all geared up to become number one. Its economy is growing at a rate of double digits, 10.3% per year for the last many years. So even for 2010 was 10.3%, inflation was 4.6%, and so on. The next giant that is coming through is India, also one of the largest higher education sector, 20,000 higher education institutes and it's planning to build 14 world-class universities, plus 13, 30 new universities, opening up a lot of foreign campuses, and a lot of American universities, by the way, if the Clinton School is not already there, are lining up to open up campuses in India. 
Today, it's the fourth largest economy, but by 2020, India will take over Japan to become the third largest economy after China, United States, and then India. The third block that I will bring out here are the Muslim countries, after, because that's the third biggest block we currently have. Actually, I would say it's the second biggest block. After China, it would be the select Muslim countries and then India. Well, first of all, we all know that Muslim population is rapidly increasing in North America and in Europe. Today, this population is about one billion, which is roughly the same population as for India and China. But all, according to Washington Post, and I'm quoting November 26, 2010, by 2050, one third of the world population will be Muslim. And the GDP of just five Muslim countries which are connected to each other on the Western Hemisphere of uh, Asia, which is Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, their GDP is worth $3.4 trillion, which is roughly the same as India, but India has three times large population. So its per capita GDP is three times higher than that of India. And if we add two more Muslim countries to that, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are on the Eastern Hemisphere of Asia, it becomes a total of $5 billion of GDP, which is 50% more than that of India. So you can see how these blocks are also coming up now. Now, among the emerging countries, of course, let me talk of the country I'm coming from, which is Pakistan. So that is number one. It's an Asian country. It's a Muslim country. And also, it's very strategically located at the cusp of three regions of the world, South Asia, Central Asia, you know, from Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, all those countries in the north, and Western Asia, which is all of Middle East and the Gulf countries on the other side. So strategically, in a very important position, and has always been a close and strategic partner of the US since the Cold War. We have been partners in CETO, we have been partners in CENTO, we have been partners in the war against terror. So we have always enjoyed a close association with the United States. And let me also bring up that since 9-11, no other country in the world has been so badly affected than Pakistan. We are actually fighting a mini third world war on our soil since the last 10 years. Uh, few thousands of people, actually civilians, have died. And in addition to fighting this war on terror, which is badly affecting our economy and not allowing in foreign uh, investments to come to Pakistan, we have gone through countless financial problems like the earthquakes, like the recent flooding that we have, of, uh, which was of biblical proportion. And yet, the resolve of the people to fight extremism and terrorism is high. And through these earthquakes, through fighting this terror, the displaced people, the floods, I think it has been a learning experience for Pakistan in terms of public service. We have organizations that we have lear developed, learned, and used. The Disaster Management Relief Authority, the Earthquake Relief Authority, the Benazir Bhutto Income Support Program, I think these are some of the things where maybe the graduate students, when they take these summer projects, they may wish to consider Pakistan in terms of how the government and how the NGOs and public organizations associate themselves with the public, particularly in terms of disaster relief, earthquakes, floods, displaced people, and so on. However, despite all these setbacks, major setbacks that we have had in the last many years, Pakistanis have a resolve promoting peace with books and not with bombs, and with the pen, not with the sword. The people of Pakistan have a resolve to develop and move forward. And therefore, as a result of that, just in the last few years, we have seen a revolution in the higher education sector in Pakistan as well, despite having all these problems in parallel on one side. The number of universities in Pakistan, just last six years, have gone up from 98 to 132, and they are continuing to grow. We have quadrupled, that is multiplied by four, our student university un enrollment going up from 331,000 to 1.1 million. Currently, the number is 1.4 million. 
and the target is to double the university enrollment over the next five to two million and to take it to four million over the next ten. So those are the challenges that we are going through. We have also reduced the gender gap. Five years back, we had 36% females, 64% males. Today we have 46% females in the universities. So it's gone up by 10% just over the last five years. Now the two factors that we talked about, how do they help countries in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship? One was the internet, technologies, the explosion of that. At the higher education, we have done wonders. Probably no other country in the region, including in South Asia, in West Asia, in Central Asia, you know, the whole region that we belong to, has done as much as Pakistan has. We have provided a complete 10 GB bandwidth to all universities in Pakistan. They are all connected together. Every student, every lab, every classroom is on internet. Every building has a video, sorry, video conferencing facility. So the universities can talk to each other simultaneously. Lectures can be exchanged. And we can import lectures from outside as well, keeping in account, of course, the time difference. So state-of-the-art video conferencing facilities and bandwidth that we have at all Pakistani universities that people can access. And it's a great learning experience. We have signed subscriptions with uh, the largest digital libraries. Each of our students now has access to 23,000 e-journals and 45,000 books right on their PC with a click of a button, something that is unique. Every university, of course, has its own portal. We have ensured that every single information, including campus management solutions, student enrollments, student attendances, marks on quizzes, assessments, everything is available online. And just our own HEC website, which has complete information available at its portal, we get about 141 million hits a year. So we have moved way ahead in terms of the use of information and communication technologies. However, we need to move above and beyond that. It's not just opening up universities like we are doing, increasing the enrollment, reducing the gender gap, providing ICTs, information and communication technologies to the universities. We now are moving into the next phase, which is the phase of innovation and entrepreneurship. Currently, we did not have that, but since we have now created a critical mass of education, of higher education, we are moving a step beyond education. We are teaching students to innovate and become entrepreneurs. We would like to create a culture of innovation. We would like our students to find and create a livelihood for themselves instead of seeking jobs. Of course, we would also want them to seek jobs. We would want them to live as peaceful global citizens in a flat world, side by side. Our research culture, as a result of that, has in terms of creativity and innovation has greatly flourished and we have produced more PhDs in Pakistan in the last five years than in the first 55 years since we have had independence. More PhDs just in the last five years and the majority of these PhDs are in sciences and engineering. That has been our focus. The number of research publications in journals worldwide have gone up six times again in the last five years, and we expect that they will go up by another 50% by next year. We have sent out on scholarships because we are short of good and quality faculty still at our universities at the rate that we have grown. So we have sent out 7,500 scholars to pursue their PhDs at universities around the world, and our largest number of scholars are studying in American universities. We have one of the largest Fulbright Scholar program in the world. Last year, we had sent 170 PhD students to the United States. This year, we will be sending 200. And in addition to that, we have set up four incubators. Well, actually, two have been set up, and two are currently in the process of being set up. Three technology parks are also being set up. And through the USAID, under the Kerry Luger Berman Bell, you know, the big assistance program that Pakistan has, we are establishing three centers of excellence in energy, water resources, and food security. 
So these are again very important critical areas that we think are important, priority areas that are important, not just for Pakistan, but for the region at large, because we would like Pakistan to serve the whole region of South Asia, Central Asia, and Western Asia. And of course, I mentioned about uh, the number of scholars going out. I'm glad to see at least one Pakistani scholar here, but she's not on an HEC scholarship. But this is something I would also advertise in the future that those of you who would wish to pursue a career in public service should definitely consider the Clinton School of Public Service as well. So we are offering great opportunities also, even to the American investors, to the American campuses, if they would like to open up campuses in Pakistan as well, to angel investors, to venture capitalists, to establish companies in our incubators and in our technology parks. Because I believe with us being close strategic partners of the United States, this would be a win-win situation for all of us where the two brains and the two sides can work together as well as create employment. And this would be to convert stones into knowledge factories. Let me come finally to United States, where we are today and where we should be. First of all, let us not underestimate the economic power and the economic potential of the US. It still is the largest economy of the world. That is still there today. That may not be true by the year 2020, but it still it is. And most of Europe, most of the economies of Europe except, you know, maybe if you take out China and India, maybe Japan and uh, maybe Germany, rest of every other country can literally fit into each state of the United States as one equivalent European country. So that actually gives you the size of the American economy. I saw this map actually only last week in The Economist magazine. It was a great map of the United States and in each state there was the name of a country that had been fit in. So the economy of that country is just equal to that of one state. Like Italy, for example, was the economy of California. So you can very well imagine that, yes, we have our strengths here also. 60% of the world reserves are in US dollars. US is roughly 20% of the world GDP and 11% of the world trade. 41% of the world's millionaires still live in the United States. And Historically, again, you know, we usually like to live by history, but the future is a different story altogether. Uh, I think we had a strategic advantage because of the World War II. We became the world's dominant innovator, partly because there was no competition, partly because most of Europe and the Asia was destroyed in World War II, and there was great immigration and immigration of brain power from the European countries and from the East to the United States. So that actually got it a head start over the last 50, 60 years. But like I said, last five years, things are beginning to change. Still the strength of the United States definitely is, it still offers the best higher education system in the world. I mean, look at the Clinton School, look at the schools we all went to, and we continue to send our students to American universities. It's still the most popular choice. 70,000 PhD students a year, the highest in the world, but, 50% of them are from outside the US. Its share is now dropping in the world, eventually and slowly. In 1970, 33% of the world university students came to the United States. By 2006, only 12% are coming to the US. It's because there are other opportunities being opened up, and even the schools in Singapore, for example, in Hong Kong, in the East, in India, I mean, they are almost as good as a lot of these Ivy League schools. Once America led the world in high school graduation, now it is ranked 18th from number one to number 18. The percentage of 15-year-old performing at the highest level of maths is the lowest in the Western countries. MIT, which of course was the leading innovator or innovating university in the world, their alumni founded 25,800 companies, which still today employ 3.3 million people, generating sales of $2 trillion. But those success stories are no more. I mean, we are starting to lose the edge here. 
the number of patents issued to American applicants is beginning to drop, and those to foreign graduates are beginning to increase. Report by IT and Innovation Foundation says America ranked last in the last decade on progress made on innovation. So there you are. You can start seeing changes to take place. Research funding. Until 1979, 50% of all research funding was provided by the government. Now it is only 27%. During 1990, America's funding for applied sciences dropped by 40%. And for the first time in 2008, East Asian companies invested more in R&D than North America. 384 billion versus 280 billion. Investments, venture capitalism has been going down. High-tech exports from America, as a result of all of that, has started dropping. In 1998, America's high-tech export was 25% of the world share, and China was 10%. Now, America is only 17%, and China is 20%, more than that of US in terms of high-tech export. And high-tech export is something that is directly related to higher education and innovation. So you see a switching of tides here. Bandwidths are important. Countries with increased bandwidth because they relate to information and communication technology. There is an estimate that every 100 times increase in broadband increases a country's GDP by 1.3%. In 2001, America ranked number four in broadband access. Now it is ranking number 15 worldwide. So I think a lot of figures here, but I'll skip more of this and beginning to therefore lose jobs. The trade deficit with China is 270 billion, it's increasing, and if this trend continues, America would lose half a million jobs this year alone. In 1940, 12 million people were involved in manufacturing. Today, with a population twice as large, only 12 million people the same number are involved in manufacturing. The numbers have not gone up. Double-digit employment after a large number of years, and I hear the unofficial figures are much higher, so we are looking at 9.x, 10% unemployment here. And if this trend continues, the negative sentence is, America's economy will become one-third of Chinese economy by 2040. By 2020, China will take over but if this whole trend continues for yet another 20 years, America will become one-third that of China. A, a matter of concern in the scientific community in the United States, as I talk with a lot of my contemporaries that I used to work with, the Republicans have pledged to cut $100 billion in budget, from what I understand, and this is going to hit education and research. And we expect that any 10% cut in education, in research funding in the United States is going to be bad for the scientific community in American universities and in American R&D labs. Most effective will be the young and innovative investigators at the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, and at the American universities. So that is going to be bad news if there is any fund, funding cut for scientific research and for innovation at American universities. So in view of all these factors that I have brought out, I think the policymakers here need to seriously consider what focus America, or what should be America be focusing on perhaps over the next two to three years. That's important. And I continue with the same article in Newsweek. Uh, the dean of uh, business at Singapore University writes, uh, which I'll end after that, is from AD 1, the year, to 1820, so almost for 1800 years in this 20th century beginning, China and India were the world's largest economy. So you see a shifting of roles. Up to 1820, China and India were the world's largest economy. In the 21st century, they are again returning to their natural purchase. As they do, the West will have to give up its ideological predisposition to lecture others, and instead develop an ability to learn from Asia. Of course, this won't be the first time the West has needed to relearn its, its own wisdom from the East. Once upon a time, the great European 
Renaissance was facilitated by the preservation of the Greek and Roman wisdom lost to Europe during the last ages in the universities and libraries of the Arab world. Let's hope the current financial dark ages for the West show a much shorter time. So we believe, of course, that America's fortune in innovation, in research, in creativity can be turned around. The American dream can be revived only if it continues to support education, research, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Otherwise, I end my quote with the book, The World is Flat. Tom Friedman writes that, and this is interesting. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion, or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better start running. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. We have any questions? We've got time for a couple of questions. Pat, right here. Wait, wait, let her wait. She's bringing the microphone to you. Could you tell us what your department, which I understand is an education, is doing to increase the opportunities for women in education in Pakistan? Yes, we are doing multiple initiatives. We have introduced a number of initiatives. One I had already mentioned in my talk that we have already reduced the gender gap. We have now 46% women and 54% men in our universities, and particularly in some disciplines, like in social sciences, in medicine, and in business, the majority are women. But we are introducing other reforms also, because the thrust in the past had historically always been science and technologies, and most male tend to go towards science and technologies. Therefore, we are focusing on softer disciplines, uh, such as, like I said, social sciences, humanities, fine arts, uh, journalism, media, film, television, and we are trying to create opportunities. So particularly the women who do not necessarily live in cities have an opportunity to come to larger cities and live in hostels and dormitories, which of course we do not have in large number, but we are establishing, making dormitories and hostels in larger numbers for the women in cities. So we are trying to create an, not necessarily an equal opportunity, but more opportunities for the women. Yes, Patina. Um, oh, nice. wait, 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 wait. It's very nice to hear some good news about Pakistan. I appreciate it, sort of a different view. Most of what I hear about Pakistan is not so good, especially the, the latest controversy about the blasphemy laws. How can you have a free and, and a universe, public university system if is, is such things as blasphemy laws and intolerance by what I think of Islamist extremists a concern? Well, let, let me tell you, first of all, in my personal, professional, political opinion is the blasphemy law must go. Okay, we need to end that. And in, in the party, political party that I belong to, which is the party of Benazir Bhutto, the Pakistan People's Party, even in the manifesto, election manifesto, we did say that we are going to do away with the blasphemy law. And we hope eventually, as we go through this political turmoil that we are currently going, and of course we have had some best bad incidents in the past, we are still looking forward that perhaps combined together with all the other liberal forces in the world, in the, in the country, we will be able to get rid of this law, certainly. Any other questions? Yes, sir. My name is Kamran Iqbal. I am a professor at the local university. Uh, having followed the higher education progress in Pakistan for the past 10 or 12 years, uh, one thing which, which uh, comes to mind is that most of the higher education progress has been in the private sector. About five or six years ago, the Higher Education Commission had a 
a vision and a, 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 of establishing like five or six world-class universities in the public sector. So what I would like to ask you is that what happened to that vision and the, those plans? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, first of all, let me correct you that the major growth has been in public universities. Currently, the enrollment in private universities is only 20 percent, and 80 percent enrollment is in the public universities. Yes, there was a plan to establish five universities in association with foreign partners, and that plan was roughly about four to five years back. But since then, the economic situation of the country, like I particularly mentioned, number one, because of the war on terror, number two because of the earthquake, and number three because of the, the floods that we recently had. There have been cuts. So the higher education, a lot of other ministries, of course, got major cuts, but not as severe for higher education. So it has been kind of pushed into the back burner, but there are certainly plans that we will be establishing these Ivy League type of universities, five of those universities, of course, as soon as the situation or as soon as the financial situation improves. We have been talking to a number of foreign universities as to becoming partners uh, in some of these initiatives. And uh, these were actually, most of them were European universities. So we have been talking to the Germans, we have been talking to the French. There is an interest by both of these countries. The Swedish, by the way, have already come in and they are establishing jointly a university with us in Sialkot. But we expect that all the remaining foreign partners will return and we will be able to establish these universities. Let's give Dr. Lagori a round of applause.